Well, so far we've learned that Saul is to be king. But that was transacted between Samuel and Saul in private in chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10. Now that which was done in secret will be made known publicly. Saul returns first to his home and he has a conversation with his uncle. And he tells his uncle that he went to uh, Samuel and his uncle is very interested to know what transpired there. And Saul doesn't lie to him, but at the same time he's discreet. He doesn't tell him everything. Verse 16, and Saul said to his uncle, uh, he told us plainly that the asses were found, but of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. Now there's no sin in that. We don't have to tell people everything that we know. He told him all that he thought he needed to know. But in the verses that follow from verse 17, we have the public inauguration of Saul as king of Israel. Samuel now summons the whole nation to Mizpah, the same place where in chapter 7, God had smitten the Philistines. Samuel, you recall, led the nation there in repentance. And after the victory, he raised Ebenezer, that stone of victory and remembrance. One upon uh, which one name was written, that being the name of God. Now that is very interesting because back in chapter 7, God proved himself to be Israel's savior. And the memorial stone was placed as a testimony to this. But now Samuel brings them back to the same place where God saved them to inaugurate a king that they've asked for because they're not trusting in God to save them anymore. So the irony is that the place of God's miraculous deliverance is the place where God now receive the king, where Israel now receives the king that they've asked for in their unbelief. So it's in these verses that Israel receive Saul to be their king. We want to consider four things this afternoon. First, the honesty of God's servant. The honesty of God's servant. Now, as you might expect, this was a very formal occasion. The whole nation has been summoned and they appear by their tribes and their thousands. And such a formal occasion especially the inauguration of a king, we would expect uh, an encouraging speech. We would expect, expect pleasantries and uh, very uh, polite words. Imagine if you were to go to a wedding, for example, and at the end of the, the wedding ceremony, well, in Britain we do this, we have a meal, and then various people get up and make speeches. The best man makes a speech. Uh, the father of the bride makes a speech. The father of the groom makes a speech. The groom himself makes a speech. And everything's encouraging. People look back on good times. People look forward to the future. People express words of encouragement and blessing. On this day, it fell to Samuel to bring the keynote speech, the coronation sermon. It's very short and it's immensely direct. And it's far more cutting and humbling than encouraging. In fact, were you in such a place where someone spoke so frankly, you'd perhaps wince. It would be maybe one of those times where you could cut the air with a knife. Samuel continues his negativity with this whole issue of the kingship. His message is, you're still rejecting God, and God is giving you a king because you've rejected him. Verse 17 through verse 19. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by 
your thousands. I saved you. I saved you from the hand of the Egyptians. I saved you in the day the Philistines attacked in Mizpah. And yet you have looked for another saviour apart from me. Do you see how Samuel is very faithful as God's servant to bring God's word to Israel? A formal occasion, but the prophet is not given to formality. A happy occasion, but the prophet is not concerned merely to be friendly. He's God's servant, and he will be faithful to God. Now, he speaks on the behalf of God, but he speaks likewise what is in his heart. And we might say that Samuel here is registering his prophetic dissent once again against the decision of Israel. And there are times that you and I will have to do this in our Christian life. We have a mechanism in our own church courts because church courts can err. A mechanism that allows a member to clear his conscience by way of registering at dissent. He can do it in a variety of ways. He can simply sign a dissent form and give it to the clerk. Or if he thinks it's of such a serious matter, he will tend his dissent with reasons. I've done this on one occasion with a number of men, and we went to the front and the document was all written out. Here are the reasons why we dissent over this matter. Because we think this is the wrong direction for the church to go. We think that the consequences of this decision will be A, B, C, and D, and we warn the General Assembly against going down this path. We offer a dissent with reason. On the behalf of God, Samuel does the same. Indeed, he takes them back to God's deliverance of them by the hand or from the land of Egypt. In words reminiscent of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1 and verse 2, before God states the Ten Commandments, and there God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Samuel takes them back there. I delivered you. I brought you out of Egypt. I saved you from all your adversities. But surely the very thing he's prosecuting against them is the next verse. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Israel, why have you turned away from me? Why are you not trusting in my salvation? Why are you looking to something less than me, something other than me, to be your savior? He's registering his descent and he's charging them for the rejection of God. Well, I say again, in all of this, Samuel is determined to be faithful rather than cordial because he loved God enough and he loved Israel enough to tell them the truth, even if that truth would spoil their coronation party. We do well to take note this afternoon because whatever God speaks to us, the church is to, pre is to preach to the world. And you and I need to love God enough and to love the souls of men enough to tell them the truth, even when that is hard. I speak to myself as a preacher and to other preachers like me. We are to be known by this. Yes, we can be friendly. Yes, we can be cordial. We're not to put people off the gospel by our own harshness or personality, but we ought to be known to tell the truth, even when the implications of that truth are going to be very uncomfortable for those who hear it. We are not to smile and simply hug people while they continue upon their way to hell. We're to tell them the truth. I ministered to a family in Scotland for a long time. One of the 
people in that family was a member of our church, the grandmother, matriarch of the family, we might say. A number of people in that family died. Her son died. I took his funeral. Her husband died. I took his funeral. She died. I took her funeral. They had a huge, wider family circle, all local and all unchurched. And each time we went to one of those funerals, I was very aware that they were not looking for what I intended to bring. The calling of the pastor, however, is to preach the word. They wanted memories, they wanted poems, they wanted music. And I made it clear on each separate occasion, all I have is the word of God. And the word of God will be brought. Eventually, a daughter-in-law died, and I knew her well. And her children, who had been at all of those other funerals, though the family had no other church connection, said, Gavin will not do the funeral, because all he will do is speak from the Bible. That was heartbreaking. But in the same, in the same time, it was very confirming because that is how, as a pastor, I ought to desire to be known. May the Lord continue to give such conviction and grace because preachers need to preach the Word of God. If they're asked to preach at weddings, they preach the word of God. If they're asked to preach at funerals, they preach the word of God. And they do not become a slave of the sensitivities of those to whom they speak. We have to love God enough and love men enough to tell them the truth. Adding none of our own offense to the gospel. But if the gospel offends, the offense is from God. But the same thing applies to your own witness. You're to be winsome and wise. You're not to go in like a bull in a china shop. You're to be cordial. But above all, you're to be faithful. And sometimes your faithfulness is going to spoil the party. Sometimes it's going to ruffle feathers of those that you would rather live uh, at peace with you're going to have to protest the sins, maybe even of your own household. You're going to have to stand in the wider family circle upon principle. And yes, that may ruin certain occasions. But I direct your attention to the honesty of God's servant in this passage. He brought the word of God because he loved God. And he truly loved the souls of men. So we have the honesty of God's servant. Secondly, we have the clarity of God's choice. The clarity of God's choice from verse 20 through 24. The people are assembled. Samuel speaks. And then the king is chosen by Lot. Now God appointed the choosing of lots to reveal his will in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 16 states this, that the, the whole disposing of the matter is in God's hand when the lot is cast into the lap. And so you have the land of Canaan divided by lot. You have Saul chosen by lot. You have, even in the New Testament, a replacement for the apostle chosen by lot. It was a mechanism by which God made his will known to Israel. So through the casting of lots here, Israel would understand that the choice was of God. Now Samuel already knew and Saul already knew. The anointing had already been done in private, but it wasn't enough for Samuel simply to go, well, here's your king. And they would say, what do you mean? How do you know? Well, God told me and I did it in private. What was done in secret is now going to be confirmed publicly. And so they go through a process of elimination from verse 20 and following. People, tribe, clan, family. 
from the tribe of Benjamin right down to the household of Kish and the son of Saul. And when Saul is chosen, and eventually they see him, in verse 24, they raise this cry. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Note it. See the one that the Lord hath chosen. How did he choose? Well, via the casting of lots. So they endorse the king and they submit to him. Well, as I said, that is what happened when they eventually saw him. But when they initially looked for him, he was nowhere to be seen. And in verse 21, at the end of the verse, into, into verse 22, we find Saul in his concealment. You see it there at the end of verse 21. Uh, and when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than all the people from his shoulders and upward. Well, here's one of the tallest men in Israel. And he's hiding among the baggage. He's concealing himself. Do you ever ask why, when you read this passage, why would Saul conceal himself at this time? Well, I think there's two ways we can look at it, two lessons that we can draw. The first is positive, and it could be that he hid himself because of his humility. That what Samuel had revealed and the anointing that he had received, the weight of that calling was so heavy upon his heart. And then thinking that he had to come now and stand forth with that weight upon his shoulders before all of the people with a sense of weakness in his own person. Maybe that thought was so crushing him, his sense of humility made him to hide. Well, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? The Bible warns us that we're not to be proud or self-sufficient. It condemns people like Diotrephes in the New Testament, the one who always loved to have the preeminence. You can imagine him on that day. He would be champing at the bit for the announcement of his kingship. He would be saying, get the throne up here. And as everybody cried, God save the king, he'd be milking it all in. Yes, that's me. I'm the king. Rightfully so. The Bible condemns that kind of proud self-sufficiency. On the other hand, it shows us that those that the Lord call are often reticent, reticent because of a, a sense of humility. You can think of Moses. Moses, I'm going to send you to deliver Israel. And Moses comes back with excuse and reason after reason as to why he's not really the man for the job. They're not going to listen to me. I can't speak. God answers all of his objections and sends him. Or you could read the first chapter of Jeremiah, the same thing. God's going to call Jeremiah to be a prophet. How am I going to speak? I'm but just a child, Lord. Humility is a good thing. A man ought to feel the weightiness of the position that the Lord calls him to if he brings him to hold uh, authority and office in the church. So that would be a positive lesson. The second lesson would be negative, however, that it's not an example of humility per se, but rather cowardice. Now be careful here because it's not always easy to distinguish between these two. What does humility look like as opposed to cowardice? Well, think about Saul. Saul has gone looking for donkeys. He's found the kingdom. Samuel has told him and anointed him. Remember last time to confirm him, he said three things are going to happen to you on the way home, Saul. And as he traveled, those three particular things happened so that it was renowned that Saul is among the prophets. Something remarkable had happened that day. So he's had the command of God and he's had various confirmatory signs already. In other words, God has made his will known. 
When God does that, brethren, it is our duty to obey. Now, a degree of reticence is good. But cowardice can masquerade as humility. And when it's not cowardice but humility, that cowardice is reprehensible before the Lord. It stinks of unbelief. God says, go do this. I will equip you for that which I call you to do. And our cowardice says, no, we will not trust you. We will not take you to be, as we considered this morning, Jehovah Jireh, the all-sufficient God who is able to meet all of our needs, able to furnish us with everything that we need if we follow the course that he calls us to walk. Brethren, if God speaks, we obey and we trust him to give us what we need for that obedience. And at that point, though we ought to be humble, yet faith in God should always be that which conquers our unbelieving fears. God made it clear both to Saul himself and to Israel afterwards that Saul was God's choice. So we have the clarity of God's choice. Thirdly, we have the primacy of God's law. The primacy of God's law. Israel now has her king identified. But interestingly, after he's identified and the people cry, God save the king, Samuel does something very important. Verse 25, then Samuel told the people, the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel will send all the people away, every man to his house. Israel has her king, but God has his law. And Israel's king is not free to rule according to the dictates of his own will. But as the kingdom begins... Samuel gives a constitutional document which explains the nature of the kingdom. How will it function? If you turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, God made it clear that the king would rule constitutionally in this manner. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17 and following. Or sorry, verse 18 and following. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God would give his people a king, but the monarchy in Israel would be a constitutional monarchy, the constitution being God's law. Saul has rights and privileges. Saul has also duties. The people will have rights and privileges and they too, likewise, will have duties. And the relationship of king to people is going to be directed by this God-given constitution. Because of that, brethren, there will be no room whatsoever for absolutism in Israel. God is the sovereign, and Saul is, like as we learned last time, his vassal king. Now, we need to emphasize that because this has always been a problem in every form of government under heaven. You have monarchy, and it can descend into despotism. Or you can have the tyranny of the 51% in a democratic society. You have a constitution as a nation. You are a constitutional republic, if I'm correct. Britain is a constitutional monarchy, but 
the monarchy doesn't really do a lot. It's a constitutional monarchy on paper nonetheless. But the point is this. God requires those who rule to rule under him in accordance to his law. If I were to take you back to 16th century Scotland, James VI is a young man growing up, the future king of Scotland and indeed uh, the United Kingdom. He has a tutor by the name of George Buchanan, famous humanistic scholar and also reformer. And as Buchanan is bringing uh, James up, I've mentioned to you before this relation, he wasn't slow to uh, corporally punish him when he required it. But Buchanan would teach him and he would see the seeds in James of what he believed to be despotism. And he wrote a book and he addressed the king in the introduction to that book. The book was called The Laws for the King's of Scotland. And in that book, Buchanan laid out the sovereignty of the king as being limited by God. And the king, under God's law, was to reign as a servant. In the preface to that book, having dedicated it to young king, he also made a point that he had taught this king, this doctrine, because he wanted it laid down to all posterity that he recognized in this teenage boy, the seeds of tyranny. In other words, he was saying to you and me, he was warned, I told him, and he went on in the face of what he was taught. Well, James hated Buchanan's doctrine. And later in James's life, he wrote a book called Basilicum Doron, the gift of the king. And Basilican Doran was a statement of absolute monarchy. The Stuart King, philosophy of absolute monarchy. And he wrote that book for his son, Henry, who ultimately died, who was due to take the throne. But having died, who comes to the throne? His other son, Charles I. What a legacy. You see those two ideas of kingship, they were at the heart of the covenanting struggle. They were at the heart of the English Civil War. They were what cost Charles I his life. And they were what what, uh, cost many of the Covenanters their life. Later on in the 17th century, Rutherford, taking up the same philosophy of kingship as Buchanan before him, wrote his famous work, Lex Rex. The law is king. And when Charles II, the grandson of James VI, learned of that book, he summoned Rutherford to appear in trial before him. And Rutherford said, I've received another summons. And he died before he could go to answer before the king. The law is king. Now, Mr. Rutherford, whose law? God's law. God's law. The primacy of God's law. Here's a principle for the whole of life and for every relationship that we enjoy in it. God is king and his law is supreme. The civil government needs to hear it that whatever power has been vested in them, it is not absolute. (laughs) That they are God's silly vassals. They are God's servants and ministers. And he requires them, whether or not the nation requires them or the people require them, he requires them to exercise that rule and authority according to his constitution, which is his law for all nations. But it's true of the church as well. Christ is king and head of the church. Why are we so jealous about the worship of God? For this reason, the law is king. Christ is king and he rules his church by his word. Therefore, the church cannot admit anything into the public worship of God that the king does not prescribe and appoint. We do not have absolute authority within the church. It's ministerial. It's under God. 
Likewise in discipline. The church has the power of the keys. It can open or shut membership and privileges in the church, but it cannot exercise its discipline according to its own law. The power of your pastor and the power of your elders, the power of your session, the power of your presbytery and general assembly, it is ministerial. It is under Christ. And therefore, no elder or pastor or session or presbytery or general assembly has any authority whatsoever to overstep the bounds that Christ has set and thereby tyrannize the church of the Lord Jesus. But it's true in your home as well. Parents, you have authority over your children. Husbands, you are the head of your wife. But you're not a little despot. You don't have absolute rule. You're not head of your wife because you're better than her. You parents don't have authority over your children because you're better than your children. You have authority because God has given you that authority and you are to exercise it not according to your whims. but according to God's law. <clears throat> laws for the kings of Scotland. Laws for the fathers of the church. Law, laws for the households of the congregation. Where does it take us to? It takes us to the primacy of God's law. You tyrannize your wife and you tyrannize your children if you do not hold if you do not hold them to the obedience that God requires in His Word. You tyrannize them when you overstep the mark. You tyrannize them when, when you don't apply God's law as well. You think that's freedom. It's not. It's tyranny. It's tyranny. It's antinomian tyranny. Then you're to rule your life, the whole of your life, as individuals according to this principle. You say, well, Jesus has freed me. He has. What's he freed you to? He's freed you to obey him because you couldn't obey him before. He's raised you to newness of life so that you might walk in the ways of his commandments. We have a wonderful chapter in our Westminster Confession of Faith on Liberty of Conscience. And it begins by remembering us, or reminding us that God alone is Lord of the conscience. Christians like to go around flaunting that. God alone is Lord of the conscience, and he is. And that's why church courts cannot bind you to anything that is not obedience to God's word. That's why Christians could stand up to Caesar and say, we will obey God rather than men. Because God alone is Lord of the conscience. But be very careful, because sometimes when people say that, they forget that God actually is Lord of the conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience, so I don't have to obey men. Well, you do have to obey men if men are requiring you to do what God calls you to do because God is Lord of the conscience and he binds you to obedience to his law. That is not tyranny, brethren. That is the freedom that Christ has purchased for you. Not Christian liberty with an idea that you can do whatever you want. But Christian liberty being the freedom to do what God commands. And that saves you from the tyranny of men. If I hold you to the word of God as your pastor, that's liberating for you. That's not tyrannical. Likewise, parents to children. Likewise, husbands to wives. Likewise, magistrates to citizens. The primacy of God's law. <clears throat> Fourthly, the divisiveness of God's king. The divisiveness of God's king. Verse 26 and 27. Saul has been identified earlier. Verse 24, they say, God save the king. That's a general chorus. Verse 26, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him 
a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So Saul is chosen by God, yet he receives a mixed response from Israel. Some whose hearts God had touched follow him in verse 26. Other men of Belial, worthless fellows, wicked men, they have no confidence in him and they reject him. Now Saul is aware of that response, but he plays as, those he, as, as though he is deaf to it, which is very wise at this point. Saul changes somewhat later as his tyranny comes out and he's willing to kill anybody at any time who would even look like they're opposing him. He kills the whole household of the priest, you will remember. But these men, in verse 27, are interesting. Because they're men of Israel who very likely demanded a king in the first place. And so they've rejected God with Israel in their desire for a king. And now God has chosen the king. And when God chooses the king, they reject God again in the gift of his king. They're well styled as men of Belial. They're doubly wicked and guilty at this point. But friends, when you think about it, they're not the last, or Saul was not the last God-appointed king to provoke such division. Although Saul is no ideal king here, yet as the anointed of the Lord and king of Israel, he does prefigure the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this divided response in verse 26 and verse 27 takes us again to the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Because God said he would send a king to save us. And in the fullness of time, he sends his son and identifies him to be the king of Israel. At his birth, the heavens open, open the angels sing glory to God in the highest. At his baptism, the spirit descends and the voice of the father is heard. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again at his transfiguration, though but to three people. But then, by the resurrection of the dead, Paul says, he has been declared to be the Son of God with authority. God has chosen his Son and appointed him to be king. And yet throughout his ministry, we find that he is despised and rejected of men. And people look at Christ and they listen to his claims and they respond like the men of Belial in verse 29. How shall this man save us? How shall this man save us? If you turn to John chapter 6, you'll find one such example. In verse 40 and ver through verse 42. John chapter 6 and verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's quite a claim. If you see me, you'll have eternal life, and I will save you right to the very end. I'll resurrect your body in a complete salvation. That's the whole of your salvation there. Now hear the response. Verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? You know, we could paraphrase that in the words of these men of Belial. He's just said, I will save you entirely. I'll raise you up at the last day. I'm the bread of life. Come to me, you'll never hunger. Believe in me, you'll never thirst. And they say, yeah, right. We know who you are. You're the kid who grew up in Joseph's house. Ah, how are you going to save us? How are you going to save us? And then in their opposition, 
they at length put him upon a cross. And Pilate writes a superscription in Greek and Latin and Hebrew above his head, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And so he was. And the religious leaders come and they say, oh, don't, don't say that he was the King of the Jews. Say that he said he was the King of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. He was God's King. They thought him to be nothing. He was the stone that the builders refused. How shall this man save us? Our Lord Jesus Christ is divisive in a similar way today. He divides families. Some believe and others do not. He divides friend from friend. One is converted and embraces Christ as, as the beloved of his soul. And to the other, Christ is as nothing. And he divides congregations of the church of Christ like this one today. Some of you sit here and you love Christ. And you know him to be a savior. And others of you sit here saying, how can this man save us? That happens every week in this congregation. Some of it's very obvious and we labor and witness in the face of that. And some of it's not so obvious, but it's real. There are those who embrace Christ. They see their need and they recognize his suitability. And there are others who say, he's just a man. He's just a teacher. He's not a savior. I want to challenge that. As we close today, I want to impress upon your heart that Jesus answers this question profoundly. How can this man save us? He can save you because he's God and man. He can save you because he took your nature, the nature that you sinned in and fell in, the, the nature that you're going to perish in eternally. He took your nature and he lived our life, and he died our death, and he offered a, a, a sacrifice in our nature to God. And yet married to that nature is his divine nature, which makes his sacrifice sufficient to pay our infinite debt of sin. How can this man save us? He can save us because he's like no other man. He's the God man. And how can this man save me? He can save me because he is able to forgive my sins. That greatest problem that we spoke about this morning, our sin before God. Christ has paid the debt of our sin in his blood. He has taken the wages of our sin, which is death, and he's nailed it once for all to the tree. And so he offers to you and me sinners in need of salvation. A free forgiveness before the bar of his father's justice. And he can save you because he's able to declare you righteous in the presence of God. Not merely forgive all of your sin and wipe your slate clean. But give you his righteousness so that you're clothed with the garment of salvation. So you can walk through the gates of heaven as one who satisfied everything that God requires of you. How can this man save us because he is Jehovah, said can you, the Lord, our righteousness? And how can he save us? Not just because he's God and man. He can forgive our sins. He can declare us righteous. But then he can renew you unto holiness. Sending his <coughs> spirit into your life to change your nature. To renew you in the whole man after his own image, so that you die to sin and live unto God. Christ, by his Spirit, can not just change your status before God, but he can change your nature. He can take one addicted to sin and make him addicted to holiness. Well, that's what you need, isn't it? You need a right standing before God. You need a new nature. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. 
How can this man save us? He can rule and defend you against all of his and your enemies because he reigns on high as King of kings and Lord of lords, head over everything to the church with all things being under his feet. And how can he save you? Because he will come again. And as he said in John chapter 6, he will raise you up at the last day. He takes it through humanity and body and soul because he comes to save our whole humanity and body and soul. He regenerates our soul in time. He sanctifies our heart through life. And at the last day, he raises up our vile bodies and fashions them like unto his glorious body and receives us to be forever with him. Now you have a degree of sympathy with these men of Belial in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Maybe they were on to something because Saul proved not to be a very good saviour. How can this man save us? Well, what might be true of Saul cannot be true of Christ because he is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. And when you hear that question, put not to Saul, but to Christ, the King of Israel, how are you going to respond to this king this afternoon? Are you going to be like these men of Belial when confronted with Jesus Christ say, who is he? What is he to me? How can he save me? Or are you going to join the chorus of verse 24 that when Christ the king is identified to you, you cry out, God save the king! God save the king! Long live the king will all of your hope not be put in him Jesus who saves and will save you to the uttermost if you come unto God by him let's stand for prayer